thank you so much. We're thrilled that you'll be joining us on like diving into the topic how to harness AI and create business impact beyond 2025. And I'm especially also excited about having you, Ian, and Sashin on stage with me. Um, and I want to dive right into the topic because AI is rapidly transforming businesses across all industries. And Sashin, like you're a serial entrepreneur, you're like the chief wizard um, officer <laughs> of Builder AI. Maybe you can explain what that exactly means in a second. Um, so you've also been a, like a voice, like an active voice in the industry for the past um, years. From your perspective, um, what are the most significant ways that AI is like reshaping businesses today? Look, I know, I know we have 20 minutes. So <laughs> that would be a five-day explanation. But um, I think it's really important first to figure out and, and state where we are. Um, you know, it's like the days when AOL launched the disk and then everyone said the internet was here. But the internet had been here for 30 years before. We're probably like a little bit step ahead of that in terms of where AI is and its real true potential to be able to unwrap and, and, and do so much more. Broadly speaking, as we speak to customers globally, we're seeing the use of AI actually in two areas. One is how do you remove human variability? Right? Human beings as a species get bored. We don't like to do the same thing 100 times, uh, especially if it requires processing data and doing something or the other differently. So this is where both um, knowledge graphs, classical machine learning, generative AI become really powerful. Right? And then the other one is reduction in human work, which is a little bit different. Uh, it's not so much about the repetition work, but it's more about, well, do we really need someone to be doing that? And you know, this classically has led to the discussion around loss of jobs, but it's actually not loss of jobs, it's loss of tasks. Mm. And I'm sure, like many of you, I really want tasks to be reduced. I don't take notes anymore. An agent takes notes for me. I used to have to take notes before. I used to invite someone into the room to take notes for me. And so I think that's where you're really seeing that evolution coming across. And then you've got AI being infused back into normal software. You know, so one of our customers is a big insurance company. You know, we helped them save $30 million worth of fraud because we were able to build a knowledge graph that showed them how patients and clinics and clinicians um, were actually charging four or five times the amount to solve the same diagnosis code. And, and so you have this ability to, to do things that humans couldn't do before yeah. at an industrial scale. Amazing. And Ian, like you're um, closely collaborating with the UK agency landscape and also like shaping new business models and bringing Meta's expertise to your clients and like partners as well. And um, Sashin just touched upon like the human aspects and like the knowledge and ways of working aspects. How do you see in that which industries like incorporated from an adoption point of view the most? Uh, and how do you also advise them to like ad adopt it in the future? Yeah, uh, I mean, first of all, it's just fantastic to be here. It's my first time at the conference, and what an incredible, incredible space uh, and topics we're covering. Um, I mean, I've been thinking about this a lot. In terms of picking a, an industry or vertical, you know, I think we're in the foothills of an industrial revolution, clearly. I think we'll probably all agree with that. And unlike anything that's gone before, this is going to disrupt every single vertical, every single business. So it's hard to pick one. What I think you can do, though, is you can look at the first horizon of disruption and where businesses are disrupting their vertical, what's the common consistency there? And I think the, the element where we're really seeing change and success is around prediction and personalization. We've heard some of that on the panel before. AI is the world's biggest predictor, and people are actually more predictable than we like to think. When you couple that to the fact that people are actually more different, so every, every business in here, every business in the world has their customer, their target audience, and we make these sweeping generalizations about what they want, what we're actually able to do with AI and with the right data is make very precise predictions about what each individual wants. You know, we've had that for a long time, kind of statistics allows you to do that, but now we're actually able to um, act on this. So we can actually start to act and provide that deep level of personalization. I mean, we heard it about manufacturing a minute ago. A minute ago. It's revolutionizing Meta's business. Our ability to predict what advertising people want to see at the right time when it's the most useful to them has transformed how effective our ad products are. But we're seeing that in customer service. You're obviously seeing it in manufacturing. We can act on what people want and give them a much better service. So prediction and personalization, I think, are the first wave, the first horizon of transformation that we're seeing globally. So both of you just touched upon like the impact and also how it really transforms the businesses. 
And then there are those large um, organizations who come with like a lot of legacy and also like they have their culture, they have their teams, they have the uh, infrastructure. What is the one thing that they would need to start with to like jump on the bandwagon and be very un like in the forefront of this rapid transformation that they need to like implement right now? So, yeah, so look, I think in, in, you know, we're, we're probably one of the largest producers of software in the world. Yeah. And so we see across sector, across region, across size of company. The, the really interesting thing that I've seen when it comes to AI is we've put the solution ahead of the problem. And so nine out of 10 times, it's a, I need to try this solution, but I don't have a clue on the problem I'm actually trying to solve. And so what you end up doing is reverse fitting solutions into problems. Yeah. Right? And, and the reason I say that is then when you then ask the question, what's the problem I'm trying to solve? The next question is, do I have the right data? Is it in a way, especially if it's large legacy industry, that can be accessible? Because it's, otherwise, it's garbage in, garbage out. And you're expecting this thing to think, but it doesn't think. It's a proxy to thinking. It's, it's just a dumb parrot that repeats the same thing again and again. Yeah. I mean, I think there's, there's a quote that rung, rung true with me, which is, um, I, think, I think it was Thomas Edison that said, genius is 99% perspiration, 1% inspiration. And I think that's, you know, that was said 100 years ago. That's really true with AI. AI is clearly genius in many, many areas. But you can't just point it and expect it to solve all of your problems. It's 99% perspiration, rigor, and process. And the piece of advice that I give to people is that map all of your processes really rigorously. And then every decision within that process that you think can be done more smartly or automated, then think and look across the market at what AI solutions are out there that you could that you could incorporate and make the decision whether you're going to buy or build and then rigorously test and experiment. You cannot keep doing the same things. This stuff is changing so quickly. You have to have that experimental mindset. So 99% hard work, perspiration and mapping out where this could fit into your processes and then experiment, you know, critically experiment to see what's successful for you and your market. Yeah, and I think there's something interesting you talked about perspiration. I think that's really important because we, the, the overarching feedback I've heard from folks is they're looking for bullet answers. So they ask like this giant prompt, and they expect it to magically get the right answer. And I said, when was the last time you had a conversation with another human being, and you asked a giant question, then you just listened for an hour? <laughs> it's not like you've got to have a conversation, you've got a reason, you've got to push it back, no, have a look at this, correct this. And so now you're not in the bullet answer, yeah. one second answers. You're now in the one and a half hours. Yeah. So we have to look at like the true, the true amount of investment you need to make in every interaction to get a credible outcome. Yeah, and with Build AI session, this is something that you do, but you also like use AI to simplify and accelerate like uh, software development. In three sentences for the audience, could you briefly tell us how the platform enables organization more efficiently and what kind of businesses are benefiting from it? Three sentences, okay. <laughs> um, so there are about 100 million Lego pieces in the world. There's only 2,647 unique pieces. There are billions of lines of code. There's about 700 features that cover all of them, or most of them. We recognize that not every single application is unique. So that's sentence one. <laughs> sentence two. Long one, um, <laughs> sorry. Sentence two is 90% of the world is not technical. Um, and their only user interface is conversation. They don't want to drag and drop widgets on a screen. They can't write code. They don't know what a development environment is. And if I said Java, they think it's the coffee upstairs. Um, and number three, non-technical customers want to be relevant in today's world. Builder is like ordering pizza, but for software, and allows our customers to build anything and deploy, because just giving them some code is not useful enough. Perfect. Ian, three sentences for you as well. I know you could talk about it all day long. <laughs> um, to, to speak to <laughs> three sentences. Okay. Yeah. Um, so in terms of the adoption, this context, um, the first one, the you know, generative AI is revolutionizing advertising. We saw a million advertisers use our generative AI products to produce 15 million advertising campaigns in the last month, which is remarkable. Open source, um, our large language model, Llama, um, been released for two years, Llama 3 last year. These are really bad sentences, aren't they? Um, you know, we've seen that being adopted at incredible scale over the last year, 650 million downloads since, it, since the inception of Llama, so more than a million a day. That open source model is leading to incredible innovation that we're seeing out there. 
And then finally, AI as an assistant, you know, meta AI, which we've embedded into WhatsApp and, uh, and, and Messenger, is being used by more than half a billion people. So they're tapping into the knowledge of AI to solve their problems, whatever those might be. Um, and that is, I think, the largest AI assistant in the world. So we're, we're super bullish, super pleased with the, the adoption and the progress that's being made. Amazing, thank you. I do think that um, like it's impressive of how you like pushed the uh, incorporation of AI forward. And at the same time, last week, um, Mark Zuckerberg has announced that Meta will like end its third-party fact-checking program and shift to a more like community-driven moderation model inspired by X to reduce also the content restriction to prioritize free expression. Can you like let us know what the role um, like means also in ensuring platform safety and how Meta will contribute to this based on like the shift that is made in the future? Yeah, and I know we should. Thank you for the question. It's um, you know I've thought about this more than any announcement that we've made in my my ten years at, at Meta, and you know I think what I want to do is just 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 clarify what we've changed. Um, so that we, you, you, you all have the context, and then please do hit me up on LinkedIn if you want to debate and discuss this, because I'm, you know, I know, I know, I know there's so, lots of questions around it. What hasn't changed is that we want people to feel safe on the platform. We have our, we have have our community standards; those are still rigorously enforced, um, and you cannot attack people based on protected characteristics. Go to transparency site, read them, be clear on what they, those are. What we changed in the U.S. was the way that we manage misinformation. So we've stopped using, or we're stopping using third-party fact-checking organizations in the US as the way to deal with misinformation, and we're moving towards a crowd-sourced approach in terms of how you deal with that. I've read more academic literature on that in the last seven days than, than, than I've probably read since I left university. And actually, when you look at the literature, crowdsourcing can get you to a position that is as accurate as experts. You know, that, that is, 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 is in the literature, worth looking at. Please do send me more literature if you see that. Um, and actually, it's much more scalable and it's less partisan in terms of using the community to do that. So we think that is a better methodology that will get to the you know, same level of accuracy at you know, increased trust, and, 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 and we're on that in the US. No other changes outside of that. The other one that we have changed is the, cop the, the topics that you are allowed to discuss. And I think, again, this has created some headlines. Um, and what we think there is that there are topics, you know, things like immigration and gender, that are part of public discourse that need to be debated, and people should be able to express their views on that. That happens in governments, it happens in mainstream media, it happens in lecture halls, it happens in you know, cafes around the world. People are debating these topics. And before we made these changes, you could not post and comment on some of these things which absolutely matter to society. And I think, you know, while some of the, the topics could be offensive, it is important that people have that freedom of expression to get their point across, whether you agree with it or disagree with it. And I'm very happy to go through the nuance about what we've extended as well. Probably not, obviously, I can feel, I can feel the heat in terms of time. <laughs> and then the final part that I think is really important for businesses in the room is that we are continuing to invest and maintain our world-class brand safety, brand suitability tool. So when you put advertising on our platforms, you have absolute control where that advertising shows up, what content is it adjacent to. So you have that ability to control that. And I know that's a lot, and I know we announced it, and then lots of the conversations aren't clear, but the big change, US fact-checking is a change in methodology, not us de you know, devaluing facts. We are broadening the expressions that people can talk around while maintaining for advertisers and businesses that level of control. I do think that it's to be proven like the approach that you took in order to maintain the public trust through that approach. And I would like you, like Session, also like to have your point of view of like the shift, but also then again, how do we secure public trust as a currency? And how do you navigate the concerns about the perceived risk that AI can bring to like the table and how also we as a public should make use of that? So look, I'll take a slightly different bent on this because especially given the UK regulation, which I think we're probably gonna touch on later on. You know, Yuval Harari said in his book, Homo Sapiens, that um, we have 10,000 thoughts that we would never tell another human being. We would tell an AI. Um, there are um, thousands of things that we would never dare to say to someone in person, but we would write it. And so what's interesting in all of this is, as the shift in user interfaces become asynchronous, as the receiving end of the user interface is potentially not human, um, 
people are uh, acting in ways that are just not common for human beings when talking to human beings. And so this is unprecedented. We've never seen this before. I give you a really concrete example. We used to have customers that would come online and say, hey, Natasha, Natasha's the name of AI. I want to build an e-commerce application. Great, Natasha says, what are you selling? Children. Now, no one in their right mind would go to a consultant and say, I want to build an e-commerce site to sell children. But you have a conversation on one hand, what do you want to build e-commerce? You have another prompt, show me pictures of children. They're disconnected prompts. And so we're now dealing with this thing, oh, hang on a second, what is the aggregate meaning of what's being spoken? And then the third thing I leave you with, which I think is really important in all of this, because it's not so much about you know, what is said or policing. Ultimately, what it comes down to is that algorithms don't have a way to, don't have a value system. I have two little kids. So when my, my daughter was three and she would bite her brother. I'd say, Samanya, you can't do that, that's not nice. Similarly, I taught her what nice was, and my wife, we would reinforce it. At some point in time, she figured out what nice was and what nice, not nice was. We didn't give her a thousand rules. We gave her like 10 value systems, and she built her own rules and continues to build it. We've not seen that in AI yet. Mm. So whether it is fact-checking through an algorithm or outsource, whether it is you know, AI sort of proliferating its way into everyday society and making history homogeneous, the biggest issue right now is we have a parrot that has no value system, and, the, and its brain is the size of the internet. Mm. That's a problem. And like jumping into that, because that is a problem that we definitely need to solve, and that will probably take us a bit of time and also think about global structures. And if we came back um, like to this stage in two to three years, how do you think have we like solved, like have we already solved the problem? And how do you also think the landscape of businesses um, has changed through AI? Um, given like the restrictions that we touched with the legacy organizations and also um, the incorporation of value systems overall? So I mean, I give you my own personal example, and then I'm going to hand it to the expert. Um, so my kids are not allowed devices. We, everyone thinks that's very odd, right, because I live in code. No devices. It's controlled. Uh, every device that comes, every application that comes, I sit in the back, I run it through a network firewall, I go see the data that's going back, and I basically decide whether it's going to be used or not, because I'm so frightened that ultimately human beings are very simple species. We rely on four chemical reactions, endorphins, oxytocin, dopamine, and serotonin. That's it. Four chemical reactions decide how you function in the day. And software has become so smart at manipulating these things. You know, the addiction to Candy Crush, for example, is an application. So I'm so nervous that our children will not know how to deal with humans. Um, everything else to me is secondary. And so everything we think about regulation, everything we think about history, another really good example, Imagine teaching American independence to a child in London and a child in New York. Every version of history has got two versions at least of the truth. You know, sovereignty is a function of um, culture. Culture is a function of history or shared history. But if you have multiple versions of history, now you suddenly make them one, you're basically eradicating people's past. How do you see it, Ian? Uh, so if we came back in two to three years' time, I mean, I, I think it's, um, I mean, it's obviously difficult to, to predict the future. What I do think, as I said at the start, is we are, you know, we're living through this industrial revolution. It's quite an exciting, privileged thing to do. Not many human beings that have ever existed have lived through an industrial revolution and worked through it and helped shape that. And I think, you know, I am an absolute optimist. I think AI is the most powerful tool that's ever been released. And I think it will improve our jobs. It will, take, it, it will remove a lot of the, the jobs that we don't want to do. Um, as you know, businesses, it will drive the productivity up. And I'd love to see you know, Europe um, you know, at the heart of that. I think there's some real challenges. You know, if we get the regulation right and we build the right environment, we could sh see this unbelievable transformation, economic growth and prosperity. Um, if we don't get it right, we'll get left behind other parts of the world. So I think it's, it depends. I'm optimistic about AI. It will improve the quality of our work. It will drive business growth. I think it will drive economic success for the regions that get that correct. But there's a big, you know, but we have to get some things right to build that right climate for it. I think that's the perfect um, ending for today. I hope we get the chance to regroup in two to three years to see where we ended up. Thank you for joining us and I hope to see you soon again. Thank you.